Good morning. Welcome to our study this morning. We're going to do a review of uh, the Passover week uh, that we have covered in the past. Over the years, we've done that since, what, 2002 or something? That we've done uh, new studies on the uh, Passover week. Uh, this one is a an amalgamation of several of those. Uh, I think this one does not have the robe. I don't. That's the best one. Hold on a minute. I'll be right with you. Okay, well, maybe only one of these will stick in your head this time. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll look at the, uh, the calendar and the missing cups in this study. And then uh, maybe we'll do a little bit on the robe uh, just out of memory here for that. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. If you need to, uh, utilize 1 John 1, 9 to confess any known sins to the Father, uh, as is the custom at Passover to confess sins uh, based on the doctrine of the, uh, of, of the uh, feather and the spoon and the leaven. So let us pray. Father, as we look at the Passover week, we ask uh, for the Holy Spirit's uh, guidance and, and uh, revelation regarding everything that happened and how perfectly everything fit together so that Jesus could be the Passover lamb for the nation of Israel. We uh, pray for the nation of Israel this morning as they approach Passover season that they will get to uh, see the Messiah Jesus in the Passover through the seders that they experience over the coming uh, over the next uh, week. We thank you for our time together, uh, the fact that he not only became the Passover lamb for the nation of Israel and all the Jewish people, but he became our savior as the Gentiles uh, throughout the world. We thank you uh, that you have given us this privilege to be part of your family, and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So, mystery number one. How could Jesus celebrate the Passover, be crucified on the Passover, and be buried before the Passover? The Passover is the celebration of the Lamb of God, the gracious sacrifice God provided for the enslaved Israelites in Egypt to foreshadow the deliverance of all mankind from slavery uh, to sin by Jesus Christ. The only ritual commanded to the church is the Passover of the Last Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. The Hebrew sacred year began with uh, the month of Abib, during which the early barley harvest began the ripening process, the stage called Abib, such that during the days of unleavened bread, the wave sheaf offering of the fresh barley could be made as the first of the first fruits. With this offering, the barley harvest could commence. Uh, the Jewish calendars of Jesus' day. In the time of Jesus, there were two and possibly more conflicting and opposing Jewish calendar systems at work. Uh, you know today that there are, there are different calendars at work. There's a Jewish calendar, there's a Muslim calendar, there's the Gregorian cal calendar that we use. Uh, and, and back in that day, there were conflicting uh, Jewish calendars at, well, at work as well. And they were primarily political and sectarian. Uh, this should quickly become evident if you attempt to harmonize the gospel accounts of the events of the past Passion Week. The multiple calendar situation should come as no great surprise. In Herodian times, Judaism was not a unitary religion, but a collection of sects reflecting a far greater range of cultural diversity than often recognized. In the, this socio-cultural milieu, uh, the priests and the Sanhedrin followed a loony solar calendar, right? Loony solar, what's that mean? Moon and sun, right? Moon and sun. 
This meant for, that for the most part, the two groups kept the Passover, I'm sorry, the Essenes, on the other hand, adhered to strictly a solar calendar. This meant that for the most part, the two groups kept the Passover at different times. The Essene calendar, attested in First Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, consisted of a solar calendar of 364 days, divided into seven-day weeks, 12 months of 30 days each, except for one extra day in the last month of each quarter. So every three months they'd add a, a, a day to the calendar, so they would have 31. The use of their own calendar was a most particular way uh, in which the members of the sect differentiated themselves from the rest of Israel. There were other ways, too, that they differentiated. They were uh, vegetarians and, uh, and they were celibate. They celebrated their festivals on different dates with the different deliberate intention of differentiating themselves from other Jews. They were against the political structure of Judaism at the time. This is a phenomenon typical of many sects throughout the world. Even among the Jews, the Samaritan calendar is different from the Karaite one, and both differ from the common Jewish one. The calendar of the sages of the whole house of Israel was different from the Essene one, not only in the dating of the festivals, but in its whole conception of the year. The Essenes had a sophisticated solar calendar in which there were 52 weeks and the festivals always began on the same day of the week. In this they were different from the Jews who lived by a lunar calendar, lunar solar. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of the Great Day, the eighth day of, of Tabernacles, always began on Wednesday, which was actually Tuesday evening since the Jews begin their days at evening, not at midnight. So essentially 6 o'clock uh, in the day. Now how do we know it's 6 o'clock? Because it's always 6 o'clock, right? Because the Jews divided their day from sundown to sundown. Okay? And part of that time was spent uh, in the dark. So you would have sunrise, and this part of the day would be spent in the light. So what I have depicted here is a, a, a winter time, because you'd have... Uh, I'm sorry, a summertime where you would have more, uh, uh, you'd have more light in the day and less at night in the summer, okay? Uh, but how did they keep track of time back then? Did they have uh, uh, Rolexes? Did they have Timexes? They had a sundial, okay? So if you take a sundial and you put a little pointer thing, okay, and you keep track of the time of the day and it's a long day, how long is it going to take for the sundial to go around from sundown or from summer, sunrise to sunset? It's going to take it a lot longer to get there. So an hour... In the summertime, was a lot longer than an hour in the wintertime, because right? the day was a lot longer, and they divided the days up equally. Is that a perplexed look? Huh? Follow it. See what I'm saying? Okay. All right. All right. So, so there were twelve hours, and I well six, three nine, one two. So there, were, so there were 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of light. So let's go uh, uh, 3, 6, 9, uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Okay, so, so you would have the longer hours because it takes the sundial longer to go around. And, and so the... Uh, the uh, daytime hours would be longer. And that's significant 
uh, for us in the, uh, the gospel accounts because it talked about the hours of the day that uh, events took place during the Passover, uh, during uh, the uh, Passover preparation when Jesus was on the cross. It told us what hour of the day the things were happening so that we could keep track of what was happening in the Jewish temple with the Jewish sacrifices. So from sundown to sunrise was the nighttime. That was the beginning of the day. Sundown is early in the day. For us, um, getting up in the morning is early in the day. But for the Jews, when the sun went down was early in the day. That's why we don't have a sunrise service in our church. Because Jesus did not rise from the grave on Sunday morning. He arose from the grave on Saturday evening, early on the first day of the week. That would be sh shortly after 6 o'clock, sometime between 6 and 8 o'clock, is when Jesus rose from the dead. So you should, you should, if you were biblically accurate, have a sunset service instead of a sunrise service. And that fits me better than getting up early in the morning for a sunrise service anyway. All right? So, so sundown is, uh, that's, this is early. Early. In the day. All right? So that figures into this too about keeping track of how, how all of these things work. How everything fits together in the... Uh, in the gospel accounts. Trumpets, tabernacles, and the great day always occurred in the seventh month as set forth in the law of Moses. As uh, Nisan 15, the annual Sabbath or Passover Sabbath, marking the start of the seven-day feast of the unleavened bread, began at sunset Tuesday night. The Essene observance of the Passover Seder was always on a Tuesday night. Cool calendar. In the common era of 30, however, the two calendars overlapped, resulting in two Nisan 14s just one day apart. Thus, the two Passover celebrations occurring in the same week of April and one day apart. That's why it's led to, you wouldn't believe the confusion. Well, it's led to the confusion of, of several things, including that uh, Good Friday, because it was actually Good Wednesday instead of Good Friday, uh, should be what was celebrated. But you have to remember that uh, when the Catholic Church became uh, dominant and powerful, uh, they were very anti-Jewish, and they wanted to remove everything Jewish from Christianity. So they, that's why they changed it to Ishtar, or Easter, uh, and not Passover. And it's why they knocked out so many of the things. why it's common to eat pork, uh, eat ham on Easter because you can't be any more offensive to the Jews than to eating pork, right? And uh, so uh, that's the reason that everything is so different, and tradition has kept that in most churches today. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees and most Jews kept the Passover of the Jews, the Mosaic Passover, at the end of the 14th day and into the evening portion of the 15th. Okay? So the end of the 14th day the way we look at it, at the beginning of the 14th day, the way they look at it. There is some scholarly debate concerning whether or not the priests fix the calendar for any given year by calculation, by observation, or a combination of the two. Exodus 12.40 records that God informed the people of Israel that the month of their first Passover and Exodus from Egypt, the month of Abib, would be the beginning of months for them. So they have a, they have a ceremonial year, and they have a secular year. They have two different years, and there's a different starting point for each one. Passover is the start for them in their ceremonial year. In Jewish tradition, the early Hebrew calendar, with its 19-year lunar solar pattern, came into being at the time of Adam and Eve. God provided, according to this tradition, more details about calendar calculations to the Levitical priests with the inception of the Sinaitic Covenant. Exodus 12.40 states that at the end of 430 years, to the very day the people of Israel went out from Egypt. So they, 
They knew exactly how many days in a year, how to keep track and so on, uh, so they could come up with the 430 years that it took uh, for them to leave Egypt. Kenneth Herman in Calendar Eclipse in Relationships holds that these ancient Israelites could not have left Egypt 430 years from the date of the covenant with Abraham when he was 99, even to the selfsame day, unless a very careful count of days as well as years had been kept. The Levitical priest astronomers kept the rules and their methods of for determination of the beginning of years, months, festivals, and annual Sabbaths, a closely held secret. In the Herodian period, the Sadducees, who wanted complete political control, and the Pharisees, who desired to dominate all aspects of Jewish religious life, eroded the authority of the priests. Control over the calendar legitimized power, and both groups sought it. In the Herodian period, the priest astronomers retained the power and authority to determine the new year and the appointed times for the festivals and the annual Sabbaths. Nevertheless, the Sanhedrin given certain powers of civil and religious administration by the Romans, held sufficient power to independently verify and officially proclaim them. So you get to pick them, but we are the ones that get to officially proclaim them. This they did with observers posted on mountaintops. It was a big show. Sending confirmation of the first visible crescent of the new moon by signal fires, by huddling in open displays of deep deliberation ensuring the public that the priest astronomers were truthful, and then by sounding the trumpet to proclaim the new moon. Now, the new moon is pretty, uh, pretty much, you can predict it by looking at the night before. Uh, you can see when that the new moon is coming. But what they would do is they would set on hilltops, they would set watchers uh, with big fire uh, mounds ready. And then the person farthest to the east, uh, when they first saw the moon, the new moon coming up, they would start a fire. And then the next mountaintop would fire, start their fire, and the next one, and the next one, until in the, in the city of Jerusalem, the, the Sadducees would all huddle around together like a football huddle, and they'd say, oh, yes, one's okay. Okay, we officially pronounce the beginning of the new moon. Uh, and all the people would cheer, and, and, and they were respected uh, because they were the official determiners of when the season started. And then they would blow the trumpet, the shofar. Uh, this focused the people on the authority of the Sanhedrin, not that of the Levitical priests. The irony is that the Sanhedrin, in all probability, already knew exactly when the first crescent moon would appear by priest astronomer calculation, but they put on this symbolic show to promote their own authority and agenda. The Sadducees, supplemented by leading priests, dominated the Sanhedrin, keeping the Pharisees at bay. The Pharisees, the minority faction, balked on how the priests determined the Feast of Weeks, known as the Day of Pentecost, but were not able to do anything about that matter until after the collapse of the priesthood in, in uh, eight, what we call A.D. 70, or the secular world calls CE or Common Era 70. Okay. The Passover Sabbath, the first high day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, always occurs with the full moon rising in the east the 15th day after the new moon. It cannot occur before the vernal equinox. That's why Passover happens at different times each year. This year it's early. It's in the end of March instead of as much as the end of April sometimes. Um, so it, the vernal equinox is when the, the days are getting longer and all of that, okay? The, let's see, was there something else I wanted to say about that? All right, it, uh, the full moon rising in the east, the 15th day after the new moon. All right, it cannot occur before, okay, no, nothing new in there. By rabbinical rules, Passover Sabbath, starting at the previous sunset, can never occur on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. So it can fall on a Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Saturday. Okay. So you follow that? Rabbinical rules, they would not allow it to happen on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. 
but it can be on a Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Saturday. Preventing Passover Sabbath from falling on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday eliminates the possibility that Tishri 1 could occur on a Friday, Sunday, or Wednesday. This is because Tishri 1 is all, always 163 days after Nisan 15. They're pretty complicated. You know, when you're religious, you've got to be complicated. You've got to keep your secrets. You've got to be in charge. You've got to be, you gotta be the, the keepers of the secrets of the faith, see? So they, they had that. So, so if it can't fall... Um, well, well, we'll get to that later. Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, was always set to begin on a full moon, the 15th day of the seventh month, which is Tishri. Okay? Sukkot had to occur in the fall after the gathering of crops. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 tells us that. So Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles. The sukkah, you know, you build a sukkah, that's the, that's the uh, tent or the or the little building that you make to stay in during the, the eight days of tabernacles. The rabbinic calculated calendar, the Hillel II calendar, provides us with a means for determining an approximation of the priestly calendar that functioned in temple times. Accordingly, by calculation, the Passover Sabbath in Common Era 30 began, as it did in Common Era 31 as well, on Wednesday evening, making Wednesday day at first glance, excuse me, the most probable candidate for the day of the crucifixion. Okay. Making, it began on Wednesday evening. Wednesday evening would be what? How, what would we call it? Tuesday, right, Tuesday. Tuesday p.m. Okay. All right, so that's, the Wednesday crucifixion. In Jewish culture, days began at sunset so that evening night came before morning daytime. Sunset marked the end of the day and the beginning of a new one. The new day came before it was dark. The context of Luke 22, 8 through 10 and Mark 14, 13, where Jesus discussed where he would eat the Passover, shows it was still daylight, but Nisan 14, a new day, had come. So, Here's how they did it. The, well, you know here um, that we have sundown and then there is a period of time between sundown and dark. Okay? Uh, you can do that. You can tell that if you listen to uh, a radio station that has uh, broadcast limitations. There are no number, I think, uh, 630 in Lexington. Uh, has that that at at sundown they have to reduce their their wattage their output, and so if you're listening to the radio and sundown comes, their their signal goes bad, you can barely hear them, uh, and but yet it's not dark. That happened actually um, one day this past week, can't remember which day it was, but I was listening and on the way home and and there. It went down. I thought, okay, it's sundown. It's not dark yet, but it's sundown. The discussion apparently took place in the period between sunset and when the darkness is complete. When it was late is opsios in the Greek. That is, later at nightfall or dark, Jesus and the twelve came. Okay? Later, opsios, later at nightfall or dark, Jesus and the twelve came to eat the supper. In the rabbinic calculated calendar, here you go. <laughs> uh, uh, you'll see uh, these highlighted days here. And Wednesday the 21st, uh, Thursday the 15th, and then of course the Saturdays, the Sabbath days uh, highlighted there. Uh, while not prominent in the New Testament, the sect of the Essenes made up a significant subdivision of early first century Judaism. The Essenes were an extremist monastic group holding to a rigid, austere, and bizarre form of religion with Gnostic overtones awaiting the Messiah to appear to deliver them to a new Israel. So these are the groups that's really looking for the Messiah to come uh, to deliver them. 
The Essenes, unlike the rest, followed a solar calendar and always observed the Passover on a Tuesday night. The Essenes fixed Nisan 14 on their calendar as the third day of the week, sunset Monday night to sunset Tuesday night, or simply Tuesday as we reckon time. The Jewish calendars of Jesus' day continued in the Essene community, the Passover Sabbath, the annual Sabbath known as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, always began at sunset Tuesday night and ended at sunset Wednesday night. Okay? So that's the Essene calendar. The Essene calendar, I don't know if I bring it out in this study or not, was always, every holiday was always the same. Uh, so where we differ that uh, Thanksgiving is always the fourth Thursday of the month of November, uh, and Christmas is always the 25th of December. The way the Essenes would do it is that that would be the same day of the week every time. Thursday would always be Thanksgiving, and whatever, let's say, Friday would always be Christmas. The 25th of December would always fall on a Friday. They, the, they had it all worked out, so you wouldn't have to get, well, what, what day is Christmas on this year? Wouldn't matter, because you would always know that Christmas always falls on Friday, and if it were the Essenes in charge of our calendar. This means that the marking of time differs from our Gregorian calendar, wherein specific weekdays are not preset to exact dates. In the United States, well, I do bring it out. In the United States, for example, Thanksgiving Day always falls on a Thursday, but it can come on different days of the month. Passover Nisan 15 was always a Wednesday on the Essene calendar. So there, the 15th, on the, es, uh, the Essene calendar, uh, the 15th was on Wednesday. Remember the previous calendar? Oops. The uh, rabbinic calculated calendar. When was the 15th? Thursday. So they're one day apart, as it said in the beginning of this. Understanding such calendar distinctions is important when considering which specific weekday Jesus consumed his last Passover meal with his disciples and for us ascertaining the explicit weekday of his execution. There have been many attempts to harmonize the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion into a coherent timetable. And they are wild and crazy. Weird, just the way they try to do it. Uh, all have their failings. Nevertheless, passionate arguments exist for a Wednesday crucifixion, a Thursday crucifixion, and a Friday crucifixion, as well as some for other days of the week. So what is the common uh, United States of America uh, crucifixion day? Friday. Friday. 